Dr. Laura Schlesinger is a straight shooter, and that's why she tells it like it is when you call her radio show. She joins us now from New York City to talk about her latest book, and the title just says it all, Stop Whining, Start Living. Dr. Laura, welcome back to the 700 Club. Thank you, I'm always happy to be here. Talk to us about whining. Why do so many of us go there and then seem to stay there? Is it just a bad habit? Uh, for some people, yes, but for other people, there are deeper motivations. But let me start out first by saying a certain amount of whining is healthy, normal, natural, reasonable. And I reserve the right to whine for a couple of days at least if I'm really upset. Because when we whine, we're having a reasonable reaction to an unreasonable situation. And we're soliciting some sympathy, some support, some hugging, some loving, some some advice and suggestions, some morale boosting, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that when we stay in the whining mode, sometimes for years, some people for a lifetime, it's like shrink wrapping your life into this unhappy state. Life is brief and it is a gift. And for us to waste that gift that other people as we speak even are losing is just so sad. Can you define for us when we shouldn't whine so that people might know what's inappropriate when it comes to whining? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I don't think we should whine when other people are already in uh, desperate straits. I have a son now 14 months in Afghanistan in combat. Fortunately, these last few days, he's been able to text message, and I don't text message him anything I'm upset about, because he's got enough things. He's dodging bullets and bombs over there. And so there are times and places and people you have to use some discretion, some sensitivity, some compassion, and pick the person to whom you wish to whine smartly. <laughs> what about people who just seem to be perpetually sad? Like the cloud follows wherever they go. How do you deal with that? Well, you could go down two basic, I mean, there are a lot of combinations, but let me just give you two basic roads. Some people hold on to the whining because they're just sort of addicted, as you would say, a habit of getting the sympathy of, uh, of being excused from responsibility, you know, because I'm so sad, nobody can expect me to do anything. Uh, other people just are in despair. And for this, my heart aches. These people are in such terrible despair, but I, I have found the antidote to despair. Which is what? And it is something <laughs> you talk about on your program all the time. It's called purpose. And when we have purpose in our lives, there is no despair. I know when I wake up and I'm having a bad morning because somebody's disappointed me or there's a pimple here and I'm 61, there should not be a pimple there. <laughs> or whatever it is that I'm upset about, legitimate or not, uh, I turn on that microphone and I'm helping people. I have a purpose and the despair is gone and I am elevated. So basically the number one way to deal with despair is to put yourself out for someone else, to be needed by someone else, to use our lives in the benefit of someone else. It is impossible, mark my words, it is impossible to be in despair at the same time you're needed. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's Great advice. In your book, you write, the people and circumstances around me do not make me what I am. They reveal who I am. Explain how that works. Well, it's interesting. I once met somebody who used to be uh, doing lighting on Broadway for all the major shows for like 20 years. And I said, you know, you work with these big stars. Uh, what happened? Have you seen a lot of people when they become famous? Do they really change? And he looked at me and he said, nobody changes. The light just reveals who they've always been. And I remembered that vividly. And I realized that when people say, well, that's not really me, how I behaved. Well, yeah, you're defined by the choices you make and what to do, especially as it impacts other people. So we are what we do. Can I ask you, uh, in light of that, because it's so in the news, we're hearing so much about the governor in New York and all that's happened, and everybody's offering wisdom to what his wife should do or questioning uh, her standing there at the podium with him. Will you talk a little bit about how a family 
in that scenario, not the governor so much, but the people around him are affected by a choice like that. And what do you do? I, I watch this woman and I think she's hardly had time to process what in the world's going on. She's got three daughters. How do you keep this from being a life damaging scenario for them? I think it is a life damaging scenario. I think it's simply a fact and not everything can be fixed. And you know, uh, different marriages, especially ones in the public eye in politics, uh, some marriages are not marriages, they're arrangements. Uh, so you really don't know what the backstory is and what the expectations they have on each other. There are some people who lead separate lives, married for the image and for the children, but they lead pretty separate lives. But when one makes that separate life so egregiously public in a horrible way, that sort of breaches the contract of, you know, we have an image. So I don't know what their story is, but there are some things that are unforgivable and there are some things that are not fixable. And my real pain goes to the children in situations like this because, you know, for, especially for daughters, I look up at their daddy as a hero in general and, you know, they're learning about trusting men from their daddy in general. And when for most of their lives, their daddy has betrayed vows, the covenant, has betrayed the family, has put the family vulnerable for humiliation. It hurts young women in particular in their sense of hopefulness about being able to trust a man and be safe in a marriage. This is a travesty and a devastation, and there is no quick fix. There is no shrink and tell you something you can do. Uh, you can pray all you want, and it helps your soul cope at the moment, but ultimately, not everything can be fixed. You talk in your book about the importance of perspective. How do you get it, and how important is it? Well, I wrote this book very intensively with dialogues that I've had on the air and letters that people have sent me because I wanted people to have that shock of recognition and go, oh, that's me. For example, one of the things in the book is about guys who leave their socks on the floor. <laughs> so many women seem, I don't know, it must be a guy thing in their <laughs> DNA. They cannot put socks away. So. A lot of women complain about the socks on the floor until I read a letter from a woman who said, I used to complain about the socks on the floor and now my husband's dead. And I'd give anything to wake up in the morning and find his socks anywhere because it, it would mean he's still alive. That's perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The book is filled with wise advice, wise advice we always get from Dr. Laura Schlesinger. It's called Stop Whining, Start Living. It's available nationwide. Thank you so much for being with us again. It's always a treat to have you on the 700 Club. It's my, my treat and bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. You too.